Okay, I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District Board meeting of August 25th to order. And I'd like to start by recognizing that we're on the unceded traditional territory, the Comox First Nation. And today we're going to read Article 16 of UNDRIP. Indigenous peoples have the right to establish their own media in their own languages and to have access to all forms of non-Indigenous media without discrimination. States shall take effective measures to ensure that state-owned media duly reflect Indigenous cultural diversity. And states without prejudice to ensuring full freedom of expression should encourage privately owned media to adequately reflect Indigenous cultural diversity. And with that, we move to B, our in-camera recommendation. Thank you. And is there anyone opposed to moving in camera after the open portion of the meeting? Seeing and hearing none, that's carried. And we have Director Lee with us today from Area D. And there's only one item on the agenda for her, and that is F1. So is there anyone opposed to varying the agenda for Director Lee? So moved. Second. Thank you. Hearing no opposition, we'll go to F1. Uh, yeah, Director Lee, can you push your um, mic when you, yeah, thank you. Oh. Black Creek Oyster Bay Committee. Thank you. And is there any discussion of the minutes? Hearing and seeing none, is there anyone opposed to receipt? Okay, and that's carried. Yeah. Second. Thank you. And recommendation one is that the board endorse the Comox Valley Regional District Fire Service Operational Guidelines Manual as the guiding operational document of the CVRD fire departments. And this is a vote of just uh, area C and D. Any discussion? Okay. Director Grieve? In favor. <laughs> Director Lee? In favor. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Director Lee. Okay, so we'll go back to uh, adoption of minutes. Thank you. And that's for the board minutes of August 11th. Anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we're on to delegations. We have two delegations today. The first is from Comox Valley Community Foundation, Matt Beckett and Susan. We have them online. Thank you. Can you hear me, Matt and Susan? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Welcome to our boardroom today. And you have 10 minutes to present and then There'll be time for questions after that. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, and I think first I just want a, a heartfelt thank you uh, on, uh, on behalf of our board, our staff, our entire organization, and of course the Comox Valley for selecting us as part of your in uh, uh, grant and aid program regarding, you know, our response to COVID-19. Uh, and we're gonna shed some light on what we did today and report back uh, on that. Uh, we will leave some time for questions, that's wonderful. Um, so if, uh, if we could just keep going here, uh, we'll go to the next slide. I'll just, uh, just briefly touch on the Comox Valley Community Foundation's mission and it's really enriching life in the Comox Valley forever. And more specifically, because of COVID-19, uh, that impact was right now. Um, and that will uh, have that ripple effect of forever. 
Uh, so again, thank you for that. What makes us unique is I think uh, we have a deep knowledge of the issues and challenges that are facing our community and we're passionate about making them better. Our program identifies long-term needs, but also making an immediate impact as you can see. Uh, and of course we're supporting uh, all our nonprofit organizations uh, in the Comox Valley, uh, just so that donors can connect with the causes that, uh, that matter most to them. Uh, so we're not in competition with other organizations in the Comox Valley. We're here to support all of them. Next slide, please. So simply what we do is we work with our donors, uh, we manage those funds uh, with integrity, and we invest in our community uh, through grants, scholarships, resources, and leadership. Go to the next slide. Specifically what we're talking about today is just our COVID-19 response. And I'll just quickly highlight uh, this piece and then I'm gonna pass it off to Susan to, uh, to discuss more of the details of, uh, of, of this, but, you know, the CVCF, uh, we, you know, immediately got into action uh, and got together and, you know, realized this is going to be a, a huge impact uh, to our community. Uh, so we had 40 separate grants totaling $232,995. Uh, and it's really on those, you know, food, shelter, uh, and access to care. Uh, then we also participated in the Government of Canada's Emergency uh, Support Fund, and that was an additional 122,000 using round figures. Um, so our total impact in the community was just, just under $400,000 uh, in a short period of time. Our committee, which made up of volunteers, board members, and staff, met 10 times over that period, sometimes weekly. Uh, to determine the needs that are out there and made, uh, made sure that that process was stuck to uh, consistently. And I think that's what made us, uh, you know, really realize how important the work uh, that we do, but also uh, how important those nonprofits are in our communities. And I think that was where it was, it was very, a, mo a very emotional time, uh, very life-giving also, uh, but also, you know, extremely tough. And, uh, and we're going to speak about as well, what we see ahead. Um, because I think there's, you know, there's more, uh, more that we can do, but there's also more upcoming that we're going to have to face as a challenge. Uh, so Susan, pass it off to you mm -hmm. to talk a little bit more about uh, how uh, the CVRD helped. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, the regional district's contribution of $47,000 really kickstarted our campaign. Um, you were one of the first organizations to come on board uh, and support our COVID emergency response fund. Um, and after that, uh, we, re we received donations from close to about 100 businesses, organizations, foundation clubs, and individuals. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for trusting us um, with those dollars. And uh, I'll move to the next slide so we can specifically talk about, um, we'll specifically turn to the grant and aid su um, supplied by the regional district. Um, details were included within your agenda package and I just, we just want, really want to demonstrate that all of the funds were allocated in support of food security and homelessness initiatives. Um, and also wanted to let you know that the funds were received from the regional district in mid-April and the first round of grants went out that very same week. Um, and we're in the hands of agencies by the end of that week so that they could respond immediately. Um, the second round of grants were distributed the week of May 11th. So all of the regional district money was dispersed within one month of receipt. And that was reviewing with our review committee, we reviewed approximately 20 applications um, and we funded the majority at that point. Um, with the regional district money, as you can see, we funded, I think it was five in round one and another five in round two. So the, these are just a sample, the, the organizations that we included with, uh, that we funded through with these CBRD dollars were just a sample of the organizations that we supported. We also supported the Transition Society, John Howard, Courtney Elementary, Vanier Secondary, the Child Development Association, CV, uh, Comox Valley Family Services, Salvation Army, Glacier View Lodge, Senior Support Services, just to name a few more. So if we could just move to the next 
couple slides, I think it's the what next slide, it would be great. So the next one, please. So on this yesterday, we launched our, so what's next for the foundation? So yesterday we launched our community enrichment grants. Um, and for the first time, we're gonna be supporting core operating costs, given the extraordinary circumstances facing the charities and not-for-profits in the Comox Valley as a result of COVID. We actually met in uh, early July. We set out, sent out an invitation to all the not-for-profits not in the community to come together on Zoom to have a conversation about the challenges facing them. Um, the need is great among all the local charities and nonprofits. Many are in crisis as a result of lost revenues, donations, provincial gaming grants, canceled fundraisers, loss of revenue from their uh, ancillary operations, plus all the costs associated with adapting to new health and safety protocols. So our board took that information and made a decision and we would support core operating costs for the first time for this upcoming round of community enrichment grants. We know that the requests are going to exceed the funds available. We have approximately $225,000 to distribute in community enrichment grants for 2021. Last year, we received over 80 applications totaling over $1 million. And this year, we expect to receive more. So the foundation, we offer a centralized application and adjudication process for granting in the Comox Valley. And we would be honored to work with the regional district again on future granting initiatives. And I think I just will leave it with that and say thank you. Um, and we're open to any questions. Great, thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions? Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. And thank you to Matt and Susan for your presentation. It was really fantastic to hear how much money you were able to flow through to the community into, especially for the regional district dollars into areas that you know we had highlighted um, were really important to us. Um, so my question is, um, since you are able to see all of the applications that the community is bringing forward, do you see any gaps that you aren't able to fund, for example, that there is there are needs in the community, but they're not currently being met? Matt, can I talk a little bit about this? Yeah, um, okay. absolutely. Um, we our funds are the result of many generations of individuals who have contributed to us and they've sometimes put um, specific um, specified how they wish their funds to be used. Some are general, some are supporting field of interest funds. Um, so for this coming around of community enrichment grants, we really are gonna see arts and culture organizations are just, we just, the funds, we just don't have the funds to support that. Um, and of course, priority is for making sure that people have food, they have shelter and they have access to care. Um, also um, recreational programming. Is, is huge. A lot of our, our sports organizations are absolutely in crisis right now. Um, they haven't had the opportunity to um, have you know, fee, there's been no fees over the summer for a lot of our organizations. Um, they're, they're absolutely in crisis. Um, mental health initiatives are, are huge um, coming out of COVID. Um, or we're still in COVID and we don't know what's gonna happen in the fall. Um, mental health is a huge issue and it's impacting all of the organizations and all of their clients that we're, that we're, we're talking with. So those are just three off the top of the head. I, you know, we are addressing food, shelter and access to care, but there's so many other things that make our community um, that we're just not able to um, prioritize right now. Oh, thank you for that. You know, I think, um, you know, speaking from the electoral areas, we, we do have some funding that we are able to disperse once a year. And to know that there's these three programming areas that maybe um, need some extra support that aren't able to be funded through the, the foundation, maybe we as a electoral area committee can, can specifically look at, at um, those types of, of organizations and see if we can direct dollars to where there's a, a need, as you mentioned, that's not currently being met. So thank you for that. Any further questions? Director Hillian. 
Thank you. Whoops. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Matt and Susan for the presentation. Uh, I just want to commend you uh, for the continued uh, growth and development of the Community Foundation, and in particular for your collaboration with other organizations such as uh, Social Planning and the Community Health Network. Uh, I think that uh, it's through that collaboration that uh, we can assure that uh, the gaps uh, that uh, Director Hamir referred to are, are actually, uh, we're aware of them and uh, we can do something to address them. In that regard, I'm curious about whether or not you have a working relationship with the Red Cross and uh, what your knowledge is of the Red Cross's functioning in the Valley. The reason I ask is because I was approached by an individual this week who said they had a grant from the National Red Cross to provide toilet paper and uh, uh, feminine hygiene products uh, in the valley and they were looking for storage. And uh, among my questions was why the Red Cross wouldn't funnel its donations through its local branch. Uh, I'm just curious if you have any insight into that. Um, I'm just gonna assume that that national funding was part of the Emergency Community Support Fund um, that we received $121,000 for. The Red Cross was a partner in that fund um, and they provided um, sanitation um, supplies as well as training on PPE as well as PPE. Um, so I'm assuming that grant would have come from them and that was funneled from the, from the national branch, from the national organization. But, but uh, do we have an active branch here in the Valley? I know they're listed in the phone book uh, as having a, a, an office on Moray Avenue. I, I'm just not sure how active they are these days. Um, incredibly active, actually. Uh, we talk with uh, Christian Bate um, from, the, from the Red Cross, and um, they operate the, the health equipment loan program out of their right. office on Moray, Moray um, and they're incredibly active. Um, and given the fact, actually, they came to, they were one of the first that came to us for some additional funding, but unfortunately, because they were a partner in this program, we weren't able to support them. Um, looking for some additional equipment because they know that with the surgeries that are going to be taking place um, on a catch up basis, they're going to be needing that additional equipment for hips and knees, etc. Um, just to make sure that people have the equipment they need to kind of get through the few months after the surgery. So they are very active and direct them to that to that location. So. Good to know. Thanks very much. Okay, any further questions? Well, thank you very much, Matt and Susan. Um, the Community Foundation has been a really important community partner over the last few years and, and certainly um, uh, more so over the last few months. Thank you so much for your efforts. Thank, thank you, you very much. And is there anyone opposed to receipt of that delegation? Seeing and hearing none, that's carried. And we're on to um, the second delegation, Lash Valley, Marita Prado, and Sandra Vinny. Thank you. And you guys can either um, stand at the podium or sit at those. Yeah, that's great. That way you can be on camera. So welcome. And your presentation is up on the screen now. So you can go ahead and Start whenever you're ready. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us today. Uh, we see today, so we see today really as an opportunity to say thank you to the CVRD for your support of the Food Policy Council primarily and the Food Security Emergency Response. Um, and today we're going to tell a story of collaborative action and the importance of cross-sectoral dialogue in emergency response. So there's a lot of news going around. Um, there's a lot of hard to hear and anxiety invoking news. But this story that we're about to tell is a story of generosity, innovation, and we consider it to be a collective story. It's our story as a region. So I'm going to start the story in early 2019. I was making delegations about the Food Policy Council, and you worked with your staff on a report to support the idea um, 
and then you provided funding and you now are providing a second year of funding to coordinate the food, the three year grant and aid program to coordinate the Food Policy Council. So thank you for that. Oh, and I also wanted to mention, cause I'm, I'm not multitasking well here with the slides, um, that I'm not gonna read off the slides. I'm gonna let you read off the slides, hopefully, if they, sorry, they're not really responding in the way that I'd hoped. Um, is there is there another way to flip through these slides that would be? Do you want to flip for me, Lisa? So if you want to just time them because they're not timed with the um, just while I'm talking, if you want to flip through. So mid March, the pandemic hits um, at Lush Valley. We had a weekend pruning workshop planned and multiple cooking workshops that week. And then one day everything was canceled we lost revenue and I sort of had this moment of thinking about this downward spiraling of our organization and collective future. But that night was March 12th and we then had, we had our monthly food policy council meeting. We decided to scrap our agenda and talk about the way forward in dealing with the global pandemic. So luckily because of the structure of the food policy council that has municipal and regional elected officials who are decision makers in our community sitting around the, the table here, many of them, um, attached to resources, as well as members from across the food system, we were able to really hear what was happening on the ground and to quickly action and plan. So, and to quickly action a plan. So for example, Andrea from the Coalition to End Homelessness was telling us how hard it was for people on the ground that were living rough to even get their basic needs met, even access to clean water as many social services had shut their doors, particularly meal programs. And we had Sandra who's talking about what was happening in the restaurant industry. So I'm gonna pass it to Sandra. So as a member of the Food Policy Council, it became immediately apparent to us all that we needed to mobilize and mobilize fast. Given the BC Health Office's order of immediate closure, the food and beverage industry suddenly found ourselves sitting on valuable and perishable foods. Lara and CVEDS and the CVEDS team invited us, British Columbia Restaurant and Food Services members, to a weekly support call to navigate the ever mounting challenges that our industry was facing. It was here that I was able to reach out and connect to businesses such as Blackfin and Hot Chocolates and Avenue Bistro, Atlas and Tidal Cafe, amongst many others, to donate what they could at that critical time. So whether it was a hot soup portioned up for delivery or prepped food or raw product and produce, they collectively gifted what they could to Lush who in turn ensured that there was no waste or lost opportunity. CVFPC, upon hearing of our local community services being unable to access their kitchens that provided the meals to their vulnerable clients, immediately responded by collectively working hard to set up what is now known as the Hot Meal and Food Hamper programs. Thanks, Sandra. And you can flip through um, those first few slides while I'm, I'm talking about these programs. So um, through the generosity and heart of our community within those first few weeks, we had raised $20,000 through individual donors. We were distributing grocery gift cards, but it quickly became obvious that this wasn't sustainable and we needed these ongoing programs. So um, our emergency programs were born. It was so obvious in those early days that those relationships that were already developed were golden. So easy to pick up the phone and say, hey, can you do this? Can you connect with this person? Can you find me this? As opposed to where relationships had not been formed, forged. There, as mentioned, there was a need for a fresh food delivery program. We talked to the city of Courtney and the CVRD who lent us the Philberg Kitchen and the Curling Club for free. The in-kind support the curling club honestly is like a dream come true. So the good food box program was started. With schools shut down, we had another food policy council member connect us with Esther Schatz, the principal. The principal sent us lists of their students and the families that were vulnerable and the next day we had food to their doors. Uh, we had members of the food policy council setting up intake forms on our website and quickly had to hire a full-time staff who was a member of the Food Policy Council to work with organizing large volumes of registration and details. So I wanna give you a sense of what's been done. Um, our hot meal program started August 1st and by the 8th, we had our good food box deliveries. 
So since those dates, our hot meal program has delivered 16,843 meals to vulnerable people and students. Our good food box units to date are 6,382. So it's a significant um, volume and we're serving at around 665. We've served around 665 households. So those good food boxes come in three different sizes. Um, testimonials have flown in, um, have been coming in and we have pages and pages worth. So we've actually put them on the slides and hopefully you get a chance to read some. So supporting local food has always been at the center of Lush Valley and the Food Policy Council. Um, the scale at which we are running the Good Food Box has been a real opportunity for, opportunity for us to test out a model of aggregation and distribution of local food out to social service programs and schools. And this has been hugely successful. So right now with our Good Food Box, we're at 100% local food with 15% of that value coming from gleaning programs. Um, so it's about $30,000 a month that's going to our local producers from the program um, and being brought into our local, um, local economy. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this. The funders, actually, it's interesting the Community Foundation presented because they've been um, funding this work as well. But the CVRD has supported us financially, as has the school district, the Community Health Network, Food Centers Canada, uh, the city of Courtney and others and the community foundation. So it's, we've, you know, these are large budgets. It's about $200,000 that we've raised to run these, these programs and are, are you know, um, looking at the initial budget was just through to July and then we've continued to expand that. So I just wanted to touch on continued need. Um, we're looking to extend these programs as long as possible. We did survey recipients of, of all of the programs and close to 90% of people surveyed. So they still need the program and see it continuing and don't see their financial situation changing. So we know there's a continued need in the community. Um, the pandemic, as I said, has accelerated our testing of a model of local food aggregation and distribution. And I think there's just a ton of opportunity um, you know, with the Courtney OCP process and the regional growth strategy and, and the sort of economic recovery lens to really scale up this model and continue to provide a market for our local producers while making it easier for people to access healthy local food. So we are really closing that loop. And I'm just gonna pass it back to Sandra. And I just wanted to say that we have deep respect for all of you, board and staff, as your response and financial assistance and support enabled us to find valuable space to be of assistance to our community at a really critical time. As a local business owner in the food sector, I believe it's imperative for us to be at the table as an advocate to support local food security, procurement and production. I feel passionate about serving nourishing food and it's with this motivation I believe that we have a responsibility to understand uh, be in relationship with and represent our role through connection within the food supply chain, thinking local, supporting local and being amongst those equally committed to food sovereignty is essential for us all at moving forward. Thanks. So if Lisa, you just wanted to forward some slides. I just, the last thing that I wanted to mention was that the Community Health Network um, hosted after action dialogues and put together a report which has been shared with CVRD staff and there will be six more dialogues to come. So we see that there's a real opportunity to reflect on these experiences from the early pandemic and look at what lessons have been learned and what could be brought forward. So in closing, just you know, thank you for your support and we wanna recognize this outward ripple. So having you support the idea of the Food Policy Council uh, you know, that's really doing something different. So not only has it has it helped us, Lush Valley and other groups to be really nimble and responsive in the emergency, but we're also being looked at by other communities across the province and the country as being a, um, a concept model to adopt. So thanks again. Sorry, and Lisa, we just, the last few slides are just showing the, um, the Community Health Network's uh, debrief that they, the, the dialogues that they hosted and just to share the story. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, Director Frisch. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Marita and Sandra. Um, of course, you came here to say thank you to us, but I think what you mean is thank you to the community who's really um, always come through in an amazing way here in the Comox Valley. So that's great to hear. I had a question about um, the food bank and maybe how you work with them and how they're doing. And then a second question about um, leveraging this work and uh, what it would cost, do you think, on an annual basis to keep doing what you're, what you're talking, what you've been doing over the last few months? Mm -hmm. So great question. So as you know, early in the pandemic, the food bank shut its doors uh, briefly. Um, to be honest, at that time, we didn't know if it was a temporary shutdown or permanent. Um, they didn't communicate that clearly. So we knew that um, we would do whatever we could to kind of support them. Um, they are continuing, uh, but I think their, uh, their capacity is limited in terms of delivery, um, in terms of what we've been doing. So what we've been hearing from our community partners is, um, you know, and certainly depending on, on how things play out with this, this second wave or third waves of the pandemic, um, that their they, ha they haven't been able to do the kind of household delivery that people are kind of wanting to see. Um, so I think they're still um, supporting, they're definitely still supporting members of our community, but there's certain members of the community that they don't seem to have the capacity to serve. There must be uh, nothing harder than lining up at the food bank. Yeah. Um, yeah. Emotionally, I imagine. So do, yeah. do you see your organizations, Lush and um, the Food Policy Councils being able to fill that role if you had funding? Um, so to fill the role, to well, to I mean, I think that, yeah, so the idea really behind um, the way that we are looking at food access is, is dignified access. Uh, that is a, a principle of our work. So, you know, um, certainly we're looking at ways that can be really cutting edge and innovative in the ways that we, that people are accessing food. And so, yeah, I mean, our model doesn't include having people do things like line up and they're not, they're not having to prove their um, income. So they're sort of self-selecting that they're in need and uh, we're trusting that and delivering services. So it's a different, there's some differences, I think, to um, the potential approach. And we're very open to collaborating with the food bank in any way um, that they're, they're willing to. There is a seat on the Food Policy Council for them when and if they decide they want to to join us in that. So um, the second question was more, what would it take to keep this model running? And to, um, and to leverage it into that economic uh, driver that um, a lot of us would like to see happen in the Valley, yeah. more food production and, um, and uh, refining of foods and yeah. processing and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of, so the word food hub can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, for sure. Um, I think what we're looking at primarily as a starting point, because it's what we've been working on, is this aggregation and distribution, distribution piece that could have some light processing. I think further down the line, we would love to see an addition of a kitchen and more sort of processing, but there's, I, that's where we need to start is with the aggregation. And I think we need to get out of the silos in thinking that, um, you know, we can be serving so many different sectors through that. So there can be institutional purchasing, there can be social service programming, there can be individuals that want to do bulk buying of local food. And I think that um, sometimes as a not, you know, charitable nonprofit, we can be seemingly pushed into a box where we're only doing one thing, but we'll consistently see revenues coming in because the work that we're doing is serving people in the charitable sector. So we need to, I think, be innovative about bringing those, those potential revenue streams together and, and, and seeing what we can do. Um, I don't think I have a perfect answer to your question about what what it what it looks like in terms of costs although we um when we went through a feasibility study we did have someone come and talk to us about aggregation and it needing to be uh you know a volume of eight hundred thousand dollars worth um to see the margins but that was only looking at the um you know the purchase you know purchase foods not fundraising in any capacity so i think there will and we're still trying to figure out what that magic number is because there does need to be a volume to make it actually um, feasible but i because there are right now and in the next few years we're going to see investments in infrastructure 
Um, and I think, you know, that the 2021 provincial budget report just came out and talked about the focus on food security and infrastructure and these types of hubs. So I think now is actually the time to start looking at ways to, to bring those streams together and, and sort of make it happen or at least slowly start testing it out. Excellent, so, thanks. Yeah. Victor, <clears throat> I'm here. Right. Thank you. And thanks to both of you, Sandra and Marita, for the presentation. Um, Sandra, I just want to commend you and the Atlas staff for, I think you were one of the first pioneers for donating of food to um, a lot of the people who were, were unhoused and were in desperate need of food. So thanks to you and to the restaurant sector for really um, coming through in a time that must have been really difficult for all of you. Could you speak to like what you're hearing now from the restaurant sector? Like how how have people fared through the last few months? And do you see what do you see going forward? Um, well, you can just imagine having the industry kind of fall out from underneath you. You know, we've been 25 years here in the valley. I've never seen uh, the challenges that I had to face on a personal level. Laying off that 42 staff was one of the most hardest things I've ever done. Um, and here we are today. Um, we wouldn't be alive because our business model wasn't primarily or 50% takeout orientated. That's something that we had to move towards. I think there's a lot of restaurant and um, eateries that have that takeout model that are thriving. Um, so this is part of the shift, this is part of the change, and the, you have to keep innovating, be innovative. Um, we wouldn't be uh, open if it wasn't for the wage subsidy and the rent assistance program, and that's our reality. We had a very healthy bank account at the beginning of March, but once you paid everything out, it, that was where the real reality hit. We um, have been back at this new capacity of, you know, less capacity, um, and the numbers are doing okay, but I've only got a 28 staff back mm. and I'm not quite sure what the reality is for those other individuals that are actually my family. So um, we still have a lot of anxiety that's quite hidden and I'm sure you all just heard about the recent uh, um, local eatery that also got flagged and, you know, last week was quite a great week. We had mm. good business. Today, we didn't really have a lunch trade. Mm. So the ripple effect, I think, could be put towards that fear of where we're going. Um, we have a great uh, support in the uh, Restaurant Food Services Association. They're incredible as a resource for us. Um, we're all just pretty much on pins and needles to what is really going to unfold here. Um, Mid-sized uh, restaurants like Atlas, as you know, um, that's that takeout piece because we're full service. So there's a reason why someone like Union Street and uh, White Whale had to close. It's just not viable. And so we really are relying on our community to understand and especially um, the local eatery that just had that flagged. I think we, we can't come from fear. I think we can just do um, our social distancing, our best practices, emulate what we're being asked by the health of officer and be good citizens towards each other and be kind. Thanks for asking. No, great, great answer too. So thank you for that. And thanks for the insight on what's happening right now. Um, Marita, I'm um, wondering, I mean, myself and Director Morin were at the Food Policy Council table. So we saw a little bit of this during, um, you know, the, the prime stage one kind of um, part of COVID. And I know um, at the time information maybe was difficult to get to. And now that you're kind of looking back, I'm wondering if there are any suggestions you have for things that could have been improved or how do we work differently that would be more streamlined? Do you have any um, thoughts about like how how that whole time went through? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing also to hear just Sandra answer that last question and the, I just keep coming back to how important it is to build the relationships prior to the emergency and how it was just such lucky timing that we had this food policy council in place where we could exchange 
these ideas across the sector and get things happening quickly. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it's, it's hard to actually express how remarkable that those early days were and how, how much heart people brought. And I mean, I know that's not a tangible thing, but um, you certainly see or don't see the best rise in people. And this was amazing to see everybody move towards the need rather than just, you know, we'd, we'd just done strategic planning and we had to just sort of set that aside and be really responsive and really aware of what was happening and, and move based on those gaps and needs. Um, yeah, one of the things that I didn't talk about that I had written down to talk about was the advocacy piece. So there was the immediate response to the pandemic, but then the Food Policy Council started to divide up into subcommittee groups to think about um, food supply, for example, municipal food policy. Um, we, we split into a group to talk about this food hub idea. And so, um, one of the things, and, and the CVRD, you, these resolutions came past your desk and you actually unanimous, unanimously supported those. But um, having food security recognized in the emergency response from an EOC um, perspective and sort of beyond that and having um, some pieces already in place to just, just knowing that food security was on the table when we're thinking about any emergency is really important. And so I also commend you for you met unanimously supporting the, that resolution that will go to the UBCM. Um, so hopefully next, you know, next time around, um, we're gonna see that that support is already there and that understanding that food security is, is um, has to be integrated into the um, emergency response is really important. And then the other uh, support, the resolution that came out was uh, supporting the farmers markets as essential services during an emergency, which I think is also really important. Um, so those kinds of things and having those in place, because it was amazing, you know, we all think about it now and think, well, of course, food security is important in an emergency, but it wasn't that straightforward sort of sitting in that food policy council and going, oh, there's, there, there's potentially a really big gap here. Um, and so I think as we move forward, and if you've read the uh, Community Health Network's response, there's a lot of great suggestions in there. And one really just speaks to resilience and the resilience. Um, you know, obviously we're thinking about the resilience of our food community in an emergency. Do we have a space where we would and can stockpile food? Um, you know, how much food do we have that we can produce for people in our region? Um, all of those things are questions that we didn't necessarily have answers for. And so, yeah, there's a, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and hopefully that resolution um, passes this fall and we see, you know, a good plan, a solid plan put forward. So thank you for that question. No problem. And if, if the chair would, wouldn't mind one last question, I know you're looking for a new home um, for your, your good food um, box program. Um, do you have an idea of the size of space that you're looking for and, you know, what, how is that going and, and where, where, where are you going? Yeah, so uh, as I said, having the curling club has been dreamy. I mean, it's uh, such a big space. So thank you so much for that. Honestly, it's, it, um, it's made it so easy to get that up and running with that large floor space. Um, we will have um, use of that floor space through September, and we're planning on running these programs at full capacity until then. And then we, we have a bit of a question, both budgetarily and space-wise, um, how, we'll, how we'll be able to continue um, at the capacity that we're at, or if we will. We have been offered, so, so we've been working closely with Jennifer Biden from the CVRD, to, and, sh and she's been very supportive of looking for potential solutions. Um, but once we lose the curling club, we're sort of, you know, we have some potential marginal options that are sort of, we need an elevator to get up and down, or it's just not, you know, ideal for access to the cooler. Um, gosh, I'm not good with square footage, but um, so if you think about that curling club, we're using about a third of that space there. And so, um, you know, we're, we're actually more spread out, I should say, just because we can be, but about a third of that floor space is really um, what we what we would need. And um, 
yeah, so we're we're definitely still looking to figure that out for the fall and beyond so that we can have a more permanent location. Thank you. Director Swift. <clears throat> Thank you, and um, thank you for all the work that you've been doing on our behalf. You've really taken care of a lot of people in desperate need, and um, we, we're very grateful for that. Um, I know one of the things that we're doing is trying to get food security and support our local producers, um, but just as you've tapped on the shoulders of the restaurateurs locally, I'm wondering if the same thing has occurred with the grocery, grocery stores. And um, because my thought is, you're, I know in some communities, they uh, really have active programs going where they take food from the grocery stores that can be as fresh produce and so on. So I don't know if, I haven't heard grocery stores mentioned, so I don't know if there are any in, as part of your program. Yeah, so, well, actually in the early days when the grocery stores were seeing a lot more traffic, we actually were purchasing from distributors. So we do, and the, like initially, because we started in April and there wasn't as much fresh food, we were ordering from distributors so that we, and, and we're also, uh, we'll look at that in the fall. Um, to be honest, we did, appro we approached the food bank to find out what, who was providing them food. And so this, I'm not sure if you're talking about the sort of idea of, you know, rescued food as well. So food that might not be available for purchase in grocery stores, but is still good for eating. Is that what you're referring to? Or either or. Um, so we, I guess that's the other thing with the food bank, with the relationship with the food bank, we're really not wanting to, uh, I guess, in a way, step on toes or turf, um, because that can be, you know, that, that, it's not a good idea. Um, so we had, I had discussions with the food bank to ask if there were um, people that we could approach in the community that weren't already supporting them. And the answer was essentially no. So um, what we have done is worked through um, a cup. There's a couple of other, well, there's amazing food rescue projects up and down the island. So we are connected to um, one in Nanaimo who sometimes provides eggs if they have additional eggs. And there is um, a national program called the Food Surplus Program that you may have seen in the news, which is food that wasn't able to make it to restaurants um, from farmers and other producers that is in surplus. So we're currently looking at um, bringing in that food. One of the challenges it's, is most of that food is frozen. So we're looking at how to, you know, how useful that might be, but we're actually putting an order in and we'll be able to get some eggs from them. So we are, um, especially as the local food winds down, we will look at that, um, but being aware that we don't want to um, step on the toes of any other uh, food supply, food programs in the Valley. Director Halian. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks very much for all the work and the presentation. Uh, I'm reflecting as you're speaking that um, the food bank was started in 1983 as a temporary response to the recession. And here we are uh, 37 years later, and it's still there. And it really, uh, for all the uh, support it's provided to people, it still functions as a marginal charity. Um, so I think that um, despite the devastating impact of, uh, of the pandemic on business and on people in the community, it maybe serves as a lesson, uh, as a major wake-up call that we do need to address uh, food security and uh, we need to address it uh, in a more systematic way. And, and I would say that we need to lift it out of the charitable realm. And perhaps um, we have the opportunity to do, to do that now, given the learning that has gone on. And uh, I think it's something that we could all work together on as, as, a, as a major project uh, in this uh, period of time. So thank you for your huge part in that. Thank you, um, Doug. And there was an article that came out today. It was in the Tyre a couple of days ago, and it was talking about, are we ready for the second wave of food insecurity? But it spoke to the to some of what you're speaking to, which is really looking at a more upstream approach to food security, a more systems level approach to food secure, community food security, which is what we want. So thank you for bringing that. Director Moran. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks so much. Of course, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of you all and it's one, the best uh, committee to be on because 
we get really good food when we go to those meetings. Well, not lately because we've been on Zoom, so we have to share what's in the, the bounty of our gardens over video, I guess. But um, I think just kind of adding to what Director Hillian said, you know, with the pandemic, many of us have been reflecting on obviously the, the stressful challenges um, that we've been facing, but also what's the, the new, you know, the normal that we want to return to. And of course, we've seen some silver linings in terms of, um, you know, uh, some sometimes being less, uh, busy or out there, um, you know, the isolating has been helpful to some, but I also see um, we've really gotten back to some of those values in terms of, you know, helping out your neighbor. I think Director Grieve would be with me on this in terms of, um, you know, really coming together as a community to support um, each other. And, you know, I remember my grandma having the, you know, the big root cellar full and, you know, somebody had a fire in the neighborhood or something and everybody was you know emptying their their root cellars to take over to the family and i think that um you know those are values that um that i think this pandemic has has brought out and and um i know that many of us on the food policy council were thinking we'd be sitting you know developing language for policy and and instead we were getting in there well not so much me but others um really getting in there and doing the, the tangible work in terms of distribution. But it's really, I think, given us some direction for some of the policy that we can develop going forward. Um, so I, I think that there are some silver linings and some good learnings. Um, and I think even just starting with these resolutions that are going to UBCM, um, recognizing that food security is so important. And we know being on an island that you know, if you went into the grocery store in those early days, there were, you know, there were many things you couldn't get. Um, and uh, being more obviously sustainable locally is, is really, really important. So thank you so much. Director Grave. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> as you probably know, um, <clears throat> some of us are sitting on a, uh, a economic development uh, recovery task force. They're looking into, uh, you know, getting reports back from all the sectors. And I, I know you you contributed with the uh, with the food and beverage sector with your report. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, um, in one of their recent uh, reports around uh, employment, uh, listed uh, agriculture and aquaculture and forestry as only 3.5 percent of the economy as far as you know, uh, people that work in the Comox Valley goes. But that doesn't matter because food is something, is absolutely integral. It's like water and air, we can't live without it. So it, it certainly is something that has to focus the mind a little more than, than uh, strictly the, the, uh, the economic factors. I noticed that the, um, the Farmers Institute and the mid Isle Farmers Institute reports had a lot of uh, correlation, a lot of commonality there. And they talked about the increased processing and infrastructure, about uh, better connections for food supply, infrastructure gaps, coordinating aggregation and distribution. And uh, I think that uh, we are at a, at a point right now where we have to all start playing together. I know that the, uh, there was some talk a few years ago about an agriplex that would have a huge uh, a kitchen that would do small processing, uh, have uh, freezers and and uh, and walk-in coolers and whatnot, where it was probably served in a multi-capacity to help that as well. So I do think that the time has come for everybody to work together uh, to look at look at farming in a different way. I know we only, I think uh, maybe Arzana can correct me, but I think we only actually have about forty percent of the of the farmland in under cultivation. It's, I think it's less than half, which, you know, speaks volumes. And when you live on an island like this, I mean, but our access to market is limited by ferries. We know that. And yet, you know, over 90% of the food comes across on a reefer truck from the mainland, which makes no sense at all. So I think that this is a bit of a wake up call and we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and get down together and work on this, this situation over the next few years. We have aging farmers, we have land sitting fallow, we have to get real about food. Thank you so much for bringing this forward. 
And just one comment on that is, is that while the um, members of the Food Policy Council are selected uh, for a term of two years, the subcommittees are a little more open. So we've had, you know, members from the other Farmer Institute, for example, in some of the subcommittees. So if there is a real interest in joining, there's definitely an openness to doing so. So thank you. Dr. Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Orita, so much for being here today and for everything that you've done. And I, I was uh, reflecting on the value of the work that you were doing a couple of weeks ago, and I had a chance to share this with Marita at Tarzina's uh, birthday party, that uh, a group that I work with called Climate Caucus held an, a conference a few weeks ago, and in each of five areas, they found a policy that was being implemented successfully somewhere in the country that they thought was a shining example of what everyone else should be trying to work towards. And the idea was to try and say that we're all facing common problems. Here are some examples. Here's how it's done well. Here's how you get it done. And in the food security area, the example was you. And it was, uh, it was a pleasure to, to hear people discuss what was being done here and look at it as something that should be done anywhere, everywhere. And they weren't even talking about the COVID part. Uh, I think they were reflecting, this is a document we put together a little while ago, on so the long, slow emergency of climate change and how food resilience uh, and security was important to that. And I think this year we've learned that um, that kind of resilience is important in every kind of crisis, whether it's fast moving or slow. And uh, in the world that we live in, I think we should try and always find solutions that address multiple problems. And the work that you do builds community. It uh, makes us resilient against climate change, resilience against COVID. It strengthens our local economy and uh, it fills people's bellies like in every way. It, uh, anyway, I just uh, trying to tear up, but anyway, I'm just, just so glad and so proud of the work that's being done in the Valley. And I, I hope that this model spreads far and wide across the country. So thank you. Yeah, I have to say it was a bit of a surprise that, um, you know, food is our, one of the most basic necessities. And um, when the food bank closed, we're all kind of like, oh my God, like, you know, there's, there's no safety net. And, and, it's, and it's surprising that in 2020, we're having to bring forward resolutions that are, in, you know, to include food and emergency operations. Uh, to make farmers markets an essential service. You know, it's surprising that that we have to do that, but I'm so happy that we have you and that you're working with us to to fill these gaps that we've found during this emergency and, and all the amazing work that you're doing. So thank you. <laughs> okay, so is anyone opposed to receipt of our delegation today? <laughs> Seeing and hearing none, that carries. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much. Okay, and we've already done F1, which was the Black Creek report, and we're on to item two, Electoral Areas Service Committee from August 10th. Okay, yep, yeah, there's uh, minutes from August 10th and August 13th. Is there anyone opposed to those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation. And you can see it on your screen there. It has to do with Lamb Road. Is there any discussion about this recommendation? And it's a vote of the areas. And since you're all in the boardroom, I'll just ask to raise hands again, like we used to do. Uh, so all in favor? Anyone opposed? No? Okay, great. That's unanimous. And we're on to recommendation two. Thank you. And that's on the screen now as well. And it has to do with the uh, bylaw, Comox Valley zoning bylaw. Is there any discussion about recommendation two? Okay, and that is also a vote of the areas. Oh, Director Greek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, um, the the whole issue around the uh, uh, Pastor Pastor Shank uh, Schwabsky uh, issue was the fact that uh, our bylaw read um, was a bit ambiguous about uh, 
about front yard setbacks. In this case, we had an unopened right away that was an unopened unopen right away that was uh, adjacent to a uh, RD park. And uh, it ended up that they had two front yards. So I think they're just trying to uh, remedy a little loophole in, in our bylaws. So that's why we're moving this forward uh, to, to make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you for um, the background. And is there any more further comments or questions? Again, a vote of the areas. All in favor? Recommendation two. Yeah, recommendation two. So I'll ask again, all in favor? And that's unanimous. Okay. And we're on to recommendation three. And that should be on the screen now. Union Bay Coal Hills. Thank you. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. It might just be of interest to the board as well to know that this is uh, the big project to cap one of the to toxic sites in British Columbia. And so the province is moving forward. There's, and the only piece we have to deal with, I guess, in the regional district is uh, the actual shore shoreline and, and not, the, uh, not the capping itself. But it was nice to uh, get presentations from this from the province and excited that that work is moving forward. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of recommendation three. And that's unanimous, thank you. On to recommendation four. Okay, and it's up on your screen. Any further comments? All in favor of recommendation four. That's carried unanimously. On to recommendation five. Thank you, and that's about fire service operation guideline manual. Is there any comments or questions? Okay, and this is a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. On to recommendation six. Okay, and you can see that on your screen. It has to do with uh, grant and aid. Are there any comments or questions, Director Grieve? Again, a little background on this. Um, as our uh, uh, municipal friends probably realize, uh, the, we have some grant and aid programs. Um, we support um, arts and culture in municipalities and what have you. And it's been a bit of a mishmash of the overlapping functions. And, uh, and, and our grant and aids are, of course, uh, are unique to the electoral areas which you probably saw when we had, did the COVID thing, we had a little money to put forward. So what staff are attempting to do here is, is to tidy this all up and round it out and, uh, and, and make it more accountable and, and predictable, especially for those groups that, that really rely on the funding year after year after year. So I encourage the, the greater board to vote for it. Thank you. Great, thank you for that background. Any further questions, comments? Okay, and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's unanimous. We're on to recommendation seven. And that's around uh, grant funding criteria. Any questions, comments? A vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's unanimous. Recommendation eight is about work on Denman Hornby for recreation grant purposes. Any comments or questions? That's a vote of the full, full board. All in favor? No one opposed? Unanimous. Okay, and that's the community works funds reserve. Comments or questions? Vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's unanimous. On to recommendation 10. Thank you. It's a request from HiSeq. 
Any comments or questions? And it's a vote of the full board. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure where I would have found out uh, what high seek is. I, I didn't see any reference to it in uh, any reports on the agenda. Director Arbor. Uh, so high seek is uh, my ex employer, it's the Hornby Allen Economic Enhancement Corporation, and they've been working on a project with them in Allen to. Uh, bring high-speed internet to the islands. It's been a long slog and they've uh, accessed grants from IST and the Norton Economic Development Trust to uh, to look at a roadmap. And at this time, they were considering an application to the uh, ICIP program, uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. But um, for a variety of reasons, um, the timing may not be right, the amount may be too big, um, one partner uh, on Denman is is not too sure about it. And I think the lesson learned here that we discussed at ESC is it's also difficult to put proposals like that when they're part of a basket of all infrastructure projects where communities have to decide on priorities as well. And so for all these reasons, it was felt that it was better for staff to work with HiSeq on finding a path that might be more viable than, than this current one. Thanks very much. Um, just as a point of reference, I wonder if uh, when we have an acronym like this uh, that is, is standing alone, whether it might be useful to include uh, in the motion the actual uh, name of the organization for the benefit of the uninitiated reading the, the uh, agenda in the minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Chair and Directors, for that advice, and we'll do a better job of that. Thanks. Okay, so recommendation 10, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. So we're on item three, sewage commission minutes from August 11th. <laughs> Anyone opposed to receipt of the minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we're on. And item four is the Greater Merville Fire Hall Electoral Ascent. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And we're bringing forward a report directly to the board, not through committee. Our manager of fire services, uh, James Bast, is here to explain the report. And it does have the consent of the two directors to bring this matter forward as we are wanting an expeditious um, process with respect to elector assent for the Merville Fire Hall. And I now introduce James Bast to describe the details of this report. Perfect. Uh, thank you through the chair to, to the full board. Uh, the purpose of this uh, staff report is to introduce a loan authorization bylaw for the Greater Merville Fire Hall project and, and to confirm the uh, alternative approval process um, of electoral assent um, for that bylaw. Uh, the staff report includes uh, a copy of uh, the Greater Merville Fire Protection uh, Services loan authorization bylaw. Uh, a report for determining the number of eligible electors, uh, a draft notice of the uh, alternative approval process, uh, as well as a draft elector response form. Uh, within the staff report as well uh, is included a tentative timeline for the, uh, the delivery of this alternate approval process. Uh, staff is available to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Director Grief. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My, my question is, why did it take so long? I was recently at a, a social function for the city of Courtney, and I was sitting at a table with longtime fire chief Lawrence Burns from the city of Courtney. And I mentioned the fact that we were going ahead and I'm going to build a fire hall in Murrible. And he burst out laughing. He says, oh, they've been trying to do that since 1957. <laughs> so this is not rushed, folks. And I think, um, you know, as far as greater Merville, let's make Merville great again. And thank you, Steph. <laughs> yes, thanks for the background on that, Dr. Green. Um, so we're on receipt, and it's a vote of area B and C. Oh, Director Arbor, go ahead. I, I was just wondering if in light of COVID, if, uh, if we could perhaps slow down the process a little bit on this item, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Get it on. <laughs> okay, so all in favor of receipt. That's unanimous. So we're on to recommendation one. Recommendation. 
Thank you. And that's to introduce first, second, and third reading. And again, it's a vote of area B and C. All in favor? That's unanimous. And um, Madam Chair and Directors, just to, to point out that um, recommendation two is to proceed with an alternate approval process. And as you know, um, the, elect uh, the electors are often concerned about local government proceeding down this way. But as Director Grief has said, this is a project that has been well planned and well prepared for. And there is the feeling that there is unanimous support in the community. Nonetheless, this is a process that enables the public to set the reset button if we don't have that right. There are just a very few um, details here in this resolution. We have to determine the amount of eligible voters, the, uh, the, uh, the process under which uh, these will be received with respect to the 30 day period and such. So those are the details that are outlined in this as well as how those, um, those um, um, forms will be submitted to the regional district, all outlined in the resolution here. And we can answer any questions if you have any before your vote. Director Grieve. Oh, no, it's Director Arbor. Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, is there a comprehensive web page and all, all that for people to be pointed at? Because I, I did live through the uh, the alternative approval process for Hornby and that was not quite enjoyable. So I'm just wondering if, if we have a lot of information available to, uh, to residents who may want to find out more information. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we do. Some of that is uh, submitted um, in the in the report that outlines the timelines and when information will be provided. But uh, James and our communications team will be leading uh, information provided to the community with respect to what is being provided and what the implications are. Director Grief. Thank you, Madam Chair. And further to what Director Arbor said previously as well, that um, this is um, not uh, creating a service that we are simply uh, looking for a boring bylaw to, to make it happen. And because it's been so long coming, uh, there's quite a bit of reserve that we're bringing to the table right off the bat. So as you probably read, uh, there'll be no new taxes on this. It's strictly the same requisition that we've been paying for years, and uh, at least this year. And, uh, and I think it has a very, very good chance of going through. One of the alternate things about it is that um, it's, uh, it also uh, supplies uh, first responders to the area. And uh, when you take a look at the, uh, uh, the average median age of, of the people in, in my district, it's gonna be very welcome to be able to have somebody show up at your door with a defibrillator when you need one as well. So I'm hoping that, uh, that the, uh, the community will get behind us and we can get uh, the shovels in the ground as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director Frisch. Yeah, not that uh, it's too much my place to say anything, but I understand there is some insurance um, issues for household owners and possible savings. Is, can, uh, can that be shared with the public at this point or have you already talked about this in the public forum? If, if I may, uh, through the chair, um, yes, um, for insured residential properties within a certain kilometer range of the of this particular hall, uh, they may be able to see a reduction in their insurance premiums. Hmm. Well, good luck with it. Okay, so we are on recommendation two. It's a vote of uh, area B and C. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. We're on to item five, the Comox Valley Economic Development Society contract. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And this will be the creation of the Liaison Committee, a concept that was considered through the negotiations with the contract for CVEDS. And uh, the General Manager is here, Scott Smith, to briefly explain the report and answer any of your questions. And uh, if you agree with this recommendation, we will be looking for three directors to be appointed to the Liaison. Uh, thank you. So uh, as the CAO said, this was uh, part of the recent new uh, agreement that we would create a liaison uh, committee of the CVRD to work with the CVADS Society to look and investigate, uh, you know, potential uh, 
uh, integration and shared services between the two organizations, and that that would then uh, be reported back to uh, this board and and CVEDS, uh, be by, uh, by the end of this year. Uh, in working with uh, Jake Martins, it was deemed that this would be uh, well suited to a select committee to look at this portion of this. Um, and so uh, that's what's proposed. And there's a draft terms of reference, tried to keep it uh, straightforward and simple, uh, but it's also there for your considerations. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, staff and vice chair. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in the terms of reference, I, I didn't notice um, any reference to how often this liaison um, group might be meeting. Do, do staff have an idea of like, um, initially I can understand probably a lot more often, but do you see a, a regular meeting schedule? I, I think we would establish that early on and start to uh, vet some of the ideas and then it would be probably dependent on some of the ideas that were coming forward. And there will be time when the ideas come forward that they will, that this committees will then task staff to investigate and bring more information back to them to that, to then bring forward, okay, say yes, that's something that we think uh, is valid that should come back and be reported to the full board perhaps. So um, there isn't an exact timeline because I think we need to keep this a bit fluid for the two organizations to raise issues, direct staff to investigate and then report back. Okay, that, that makes sense. And do you have an idea of um, who this liaison group would be meeting with? Is that with CVED staff or with the board or a combination of both? It would be with the board, some uh, a committee of the board. Now they may be supported by some of the CVET staff too, just like uh, the liaison team from our side is gonna receive some support from our staff. Um, I, I expect most of the support, frankly, to come from our staff, uh, but it would be with their uh, a committee of their board members would okay. be that connection. Okay, thank you. Okay, Director Grieve. Thank you very much and uh, thank you, Scott. Um, I just wanna say, uh, as we're finally Making, making it through this, this ordeal that um, I think that we had in Director Grant, Healy and Arbor, uh, a very honest and respectful team that worked very hard to get this through. And I know when it comes to the recommendation, I would be still, I would be supporting those three names going forward because I think they've built the relationships, they have the understanding and uh, we, we can, uh, we can build from here, bury the hatchet and move on in times like this when we really need economic development. Thank you. Okay, we are still on receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried and we're on to the recommendation. And it's set the terms of reference to attach to the staff report um, be approved and that we appoint three directors to the liaison committee. Director Grieve. Well, I move that recommendation. And once again, I put forward the names, if they're willing, of uh, Director Grant, Director Hillian, and Director Arbor. I'd second that. Um, Director Frisch, do you wish to speak to the motion? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So, um, as you all know, I've had some um, some issues with how the process has moved forward, and uh, I'm actually really happy to see this uh, com committee come forward and put together. And I'm very interested in serving on this committee and bringing forward my views on uh, economic development and and how it should move forward uh, to this committee. So um, I'm going to uh, vote against uh, that composition and um, and hope that my name gets put forward at some point. Thanks. Do the nominees want to speak to whether they will accept or not? Okay. So the motion on the floor is that we appoint Director Grant, Hillian, and Arbor. Director Hillian. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I think that uh, 
the point made by uh, Director Grieve that a relationship has been established is a valid one. I don't uh, underestimate uh, the work involved in this. Um, and I know that um, a number of directors, myself included, uh, continue to have reservations about uh, the, um, uh, the structure and uh, the history of the uh, CVEDS organization moving forward. I think we do have an opportunity now, uh, regardless of who serves on this particular committee, to either make this work or not. And uh, uh, I'm willing to carry on. I'm, I'm also fine with the direction of the board if uh, they'd prefer to have Director Frisch sit as the uh, Courtney representative. Thanks. Thank you. Director Hamir. Thank you, Chair. Um, as uh, Director Frisch mentioned, I, I too have had some reservations about the process going forward. Um, one of the concerns that I have is just on how this service would um, use the, the lenses that we as a board have agreed to, um, you know, in terms of uh, reconciliation, climate change, fiscal responsibility, and community um, initiatives. Uh, to ensure that those, all four of those drivers and lenses continue, um, especially within the service. And there's been a few kind of glaring um, gaps, I would say, in the service. So um, I would be voting, I'm going to be voting against that um, recommendation just because I do have um, some others in mind in terms of who would, who would be able to um, ensure that those lenses are, are better um, put forward and, and equally represented. Um, so that, that would be my opinion. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I am also, I think, uh, much like Director Hamir, I'm going to vote against the, the, this composition. Um, it seemed that there were a number of different schools of thought that around this table and they were quite divided over the course of discussions. Uh, some perhaps uh, feeling that uh, this agreement had gone, I don't want to characterize the, um, this, but I think there was a, there was a, a group of people and I counted myself among them many times who had reservations about this, uh, about this particular agreement. And I think it would be good to have a representative on that, uh, on that select committee, which clearly represents that viewpoint. I think we're only gonna come out of this united as, as a board and with clear confidence in what we've done if, if the full spectrum of viewpoints are represented appropriately and respectfully in discussions with, uh, with CBEDS. And uh, yeah, thank you. Scott, go ahead. Um, I guess I just would like to mention one thing too that this group is going to be asked and tasked to look at, you know, what integrated services and shared services there might be, like like uh, financial reporting, those kinds of things. There still is going to be an opportunity for the entire board in a in a facilitated session in October to talk about some of those broader economic uh, services and where we might go. So I don't want the board to think this is the only opportunity for elected officials to to get involved in this. But just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Director Morin. Great, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, uh, I would also like to see a different composition, um, not because of any uh, one person. And I think, um, you know, we wanna balance it between the electoral areas, Courtney Comox. So, um, so it's certainly not, um, against any one particular person, but I think that um, it's an opportunity to have some of those um, maybe perspectives brought forward that um, some of us didn't feel were, you know, with great respect to the committee, because I know it was tons of work and negotiating under very challenging circumstances um, with, you know, with, with a board with a lot of um, differing views. And I, can't imagine it was it was easy, um, so I do really respect and appreciate the work that went in. But I I would like to see um, a different composition um, of this of this committee going forward. 
Thanks. Thank you, Director Arbor. Thank you. I thought it was a good process. I think that all the representatives uh, connected back with their respective constituents, in my case, the electoral areas, we had a number of check-ins. I know uh, Director Hellion and Director Grant did the same. But considering there's a number of views that don't feel like that, I will um, withdraw my name from contest and uh, vote against the motion as well. Okay, I see you know for the lights, so we will take a vote. Um, it's of area ABC and Courtney and Comox. Cumberland is not included on this vote. All in favor? All, any opposed? Did you get? The motion is defeated. So we're back to the recommendation. Um, just a question on process. Um, would it be easier to select single names at a time rather than a full slate? I'm just sort of, you know, asking the board if that might be easier or do we want to put forward a slate? Just to uh, one of the things that was done when you previously appointed these members to negotiate, you had representation from the electoral areas in each of the municipalities. Just to draw that to your attention. So it's up to the board if, if we want to um, just, uh, well, part of the motion is to um, approve um, the terms of reference. Um, so we could do that and then um, we could go through and then and elect individuals one at a time if that serves our purposes. Director Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'll move that we approve the terms of reference. Thank you. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. So who would like to put forward a name first? Director Mir. Um, I'd like to rec or propose uh, Director Arbor for the electoral areas representative. Second. Oh. So he's declined the nomination. So does anyone else want to put forward a name? Director Frisch. Oh, sorry. It's. Oh, yep, go ahead. I'd like to move that we put forward uh, Director Hamir's name. Do I have a second? Okay. Any further comment, Director? Great, okay. Um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. So we have Director Hamir as one of the appointees. Next. <laughs> uh, is your mic on? Yeah, go ahead, Director Swift. I'd like to nominate uh, Director Grant from Comox. Um, I'm not seeing this going in any way in, in a direction that is looking to make this a better service. Um, I was quite excited about sitting on this and trying to find a better way to move this forward. I am not seeing that happening here. So I'm gonna decline and not put my name forward. Okay. Any further names? Director Frisch? I'd like to nominate, nominate Director Swift. Is there a second? <laughs> Director Swift, do you accept? Well, I, I guess I have the same concerns as, as Director Grant. And unfortunately, he's had a lot of experience with the Economic Development Group and is well aware of the complexities of it. Um, and yet, if I decline, then we don't have a representative from Comox. So, um, 
I guess I'll accept it. Thank you. So all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, yeah. sure. So we're gonna go through the list of names just so um, it's a little bit easier rather than her having to look at all your hands all at once. <laughs> okay, so this is for uh, Director Swift um, appointment to the committee. So Director Cole Hamilton. Director Morin, Director Frisch, Director Hillian, Director Swift, Director Grant, opposed, Director Grieve, in favor, Director Arbor, Director Hamir, okay, and that carries. So we have one seat left, uh, Director Grieve. Once again, um, I would like to uh, uh, celebrate the work that the original three did on this. And I, a lot of it was uh, by no means uh, easy. And I do think that uh, as chair of that group, I think Doug did a, a fantastic job. I think Doug has the right kind of conciliatory um, uh, meet at the middle kind of uh, attitude that we need uh, rather than coming at this from a dogmatic viewpoint. I think uh, I would recommend that we uh, keep Doug on this this uh, this committee. Thank you. Do you have a second for Director Hillian? Thank you. Director Arbor, do you wish to speak to his appointment? Yes, <clears throat> Having worked with uh, Chair uh, Hillian on this committee, I can attest that he has brought tremendous value to the process. I don't think we would be in the uh, in the good situation we are now if it wasn't for his calm leadership at that table. He has also developed what I've considered a very important relationship with board members um, of CVADS. And um, it's for that reason I'm, I would love to see him continue. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hamir. Um, you know, well, I'd like also like to commend uh, Director Hillian and Chair Hillian for for the work that was done. It was not an easy task. I think um, I can sort of see this as sort of turning the, the Titanic in many ways. Um, this is a service that's been in 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 place for over a decade, and it could not have been easy, um, considering all the differing viewpoints that are around this table, as we know right now. Having said that, I still think. Um, you know, uh, what this liaison committee is being tasked to do is, is different from what the initial group um, was asked. And so this is a group that's um, looking at um, keeping, it, uh, you know, up to date on, on what the outcomes are and ensuring the, the financial um, reporting is done. It's, it's a much more, um, it is a committee that has to really be on point I think, and, and has to be a little bit more hard edged um, because it's reporting back to this group and it's it's actually taking resources from, from the, I know the other group did as well, but this is now going to be, a, you know, a committee that um, is um, going to be meeting much more regularly and for a longer term. So for that reason, um, I would also like to um, recommend uh, Director Morin be on that table. Um, you know, I think her viewpoints and her um, relationships with uh, especially community groups, um, with uh, nonprofit groups, the arts sector, um, relationships with First Nations, I think are, are going to be really important moving forward. Um, yeah, we, we do. I did believe that Director Hamir was speaking toward um, the appointment of Director Hillian. So, okay. So we're not doing an election. You have, we have to go one at a time. Is that yes? And we have two appointees okay. already. I apologize. I will. Yeah. I will um, rescind my my recommendation. So the motion on the floor is to appoint Director Hillian. Any further comments on that motion? Director Hillian. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. It's it's a bit awkward. Uh, I, you know, I have to decide: do I subject myself to the indignity of being voted down by my uh, Courtney colleagues? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm tempted to decline, but uh, for the sake of uh, democracy, I shall uh, let my name stand. Okay. So we'll go through the roll. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. In favor. Director Frisch. In favor. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. In favor. Director Grieve. In favor. In favor. Director Arbor. In favor. Director Hamir. In against. In favor. So that's unanimous. Oh, sorry, that was again opposed. Oh, sorry. Okay. Opposed, and it's still carried. Yep. So that that is the committee. Director Hamir, Director Swift, and Director Hillian. Thank you. And we're on to item six, 2020 grant and aid. Thank you. And um, it, there's an item for receipt. Is anyone opposed to receipt? And that's carried. So there's a requested action. Thank you. And it's there on the screen regarding the old church theater. Is there any discussion, Director Arbor? I, I would just like to point out that this is one of those rare opportunities where we keep can keep a close eye on one of our grantees. <laughs> Thank you. And this is a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item seven. And that's the living wage procurement policy. And I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, our manager of procurement, Scott Hainsworth, is on the line. He'll provide a brief outline of this change in the policy and answer any of your questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Russell. Uh, through the Chair, uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the CVRD was interested in exploring be becoming a living wage employer. At the CVRD board meeting on May 12, 2020, the CVRD board passed a motion to amend the CVRD procurement policy to include a provision of living wages as part of, as part of the sustainable procurement section in the procurement policy. A second motion proposed that the amendments to the policy be first uh, sent to the Coma Shrathkona Waste Management Board for referral prior to formal adoption. Mm -hmm. Included in the staff report, staff have provided a red line version of the policy in Appendix A for initial consideration by the board prior to referral to the Coma Shrathkona Waste Management Board. Mm -hmm. If the revisions are endorsed today, uh, staff will refer the matter to the CSWM board for feedback and report back to this board uh, should there be any objection or are there suggestions received. The living wage considerations are included in section 7.3 of the policy, which is on page six of 13 of the appendix, as well as in the definitions uh, to the policy to, to help support the language that's been included. Uh, staff do continue to pilot sustainability and social value provisions uh, in our procurements uh, with appropriate risk profiles. So we haven't rolled it out to all procurements that we've been issuing publicly at this time. We, we continue to be selective about that as, as we take advantage of the educational and, and other opportunities provided by the Coastal uh, Community Social Procurement Initiative. A few other minor updates included in the amendment uh, are, are there to reflect the addition of the Deputy Chief Administrative role at the Regional District, as well as a, a, job, a job title change for the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, if the, the policy is approved as drafted, uh, the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer would be delegated the authority of the CAO in, in the CAO's absence, and that would automatically occur. Uh, with that, I'm happy to accept, uh, take any questions that I can answer. Thank you for the report. Are there any questions? Director Hamir? Not a question, but just a comment of um, thanks to, to staff for continuing to explore the living wage um, in all of the different capacities that you have. It, it was something that I think this board um, really wanted to see. And, and I had actually thought it would 
was kind of shelved for a, for a moment of time. So I'm really happy that behind the scenes, you continue to work on that. So I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I think it was um, easier for us to, um, to have the living wage applied within a, our own um, uh, organization, but it was the, uh, uh, the application of it to contractors that, that muddied the waters a bit. But I think this is a good um, resolution to that. So we're on receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? That's carried and there's a recommendation. Any comments, questions on the recommendation? And it's a vote of the full board. Oh, Director Hillian, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I'm just curious uh, whether uh, uh, staff has any um, uh, plans to to move beyond uh, this in the procurement policy, or if, if that's where we've decided it will reside. I'll um, ask Scott just to answer that. Sure. Um, just if I could clarify the question, uh, Director Hillian, um, in terms of moving beyond the piloting and, and a more fulsome rollout of the, the sustainable procurement provisions within the policy, is that my understanding? I was thinking more in terms of uh, the, the uh, living wage uh, um, resolution applying to the overall board uh, um, and organization as opposed to simply the procurement policy. I think the initial um, action of the regional district was to confirm that it applies to, to staff. The second action was to consider it through the procurement policy. So I would think that this fulfills the board's direction th at current with respect to the living wage. So it already does apply to the board. No. And are we on record as a, as a living wage employer as a, the chef or the uh, Comox Valley Regional District? Um, uh, we are living up to the um, the um, standards of the living wage, but I don't think we we committed or the board committed to to registering as a living wage employer. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further questions, so we're on the recommendation. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item eight. Board Code of Conduct Policy. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And James Warren is here to uh, present this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Russell, and through the Chair to the Board. Uh, so you'll recall that uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jake Martins presented the report about the policy revamp and, and adjusting the um, policies that have come to the Board. Um, that included rescinding a number of policies. And one of the immediate steps from that process was to introduce a code of conduct policy that would assist with um, assist and guide behavioral roles and expectations for the, uh, for the board of directors and alternate directors. Appendix A on the report uh, is that draft policy and it follows best practices that have come out of the Union of British Columbia Municipalities and, and other um, leading authorities. Um, the policy doesn't speak to all of the different legislative requirements that you may have to follow, uh, whether that be in the community charter or the local government app, uh, but it does speak to some of the overarching principles of conduct. And uh, we can go through any of those particular elements if you want to. Um, I would ask if you consider the recommendation on the agenda that you also um, add into that um, a subject to input from the CSWM, the Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board, to practice we're trying to do to make sure that that board has has uh, in input, and so we'd just like to to reflect that in the resolution. So, uh, open for any questions you might have. Thank you, Director Helian. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to staff for the report. I believe uh, there is reference made in the report to there not being any. Um, uh, enforcement provisions for lack of a better word and I, I'm just uh, interested in uh, the thinking behind that. I, I realize it's uh, fraught with uh, difficulty but uh, I'd just be interested in the thinking process behind not having something that applies to uh, how the board might respond if it felt there was a breach. Uh, thanks for that. I, I think that you're you're right the enforcement yeah, the application of that enforcement is extremely difficult. Um, I know in, in terms of criminal, criminal matters in some other jurisdictions, it's been extremely difficult to, to pursue that. Uh, and so I think it's, um, it's meant that this code of conduct policy is, a, is an aspirational document that um, you as directors are, are seen to be upholding and supporting and, and holding each other to account. 
uh, rather than taking any kind of punitive action on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Arbor. Thank you, Director Hillian, and I had the same thought. And um, but I, I, um, I, I think this board could consider um, going beyond what staff is describing as a method of self-enforcement. And perhaps the word enforcement uh, may not be the most suited. I could look at it as recourse. Um, currently, we do not have a process, so there are situations that can arise where it's not even clear if this should go to the chair and in what capacity. So if somebody felt that a director was uh, inappropriate, um, another director may not know how to address that if they have that sentiment. So even to the course language around um, the role of the chair or vice chair or staff in certain situations that are likely to arise and continue to arise in the course of political duty. Because I believe that as an aspirational document, especially the way that it's currently languaged, every single director will have a different interpretation around most of these principles. And I think it would be um, desirable for elected officials to have, as other staff of the regional district do, some kind of, of recourse process. Um, and, and this, I realize not everybody agree with, but, and we've had a really good board. <laughs> so when I think about this, I, I think about future eventualities and boards that can be dysfunctional. I think the value of a policy, as Dr. Hillian highlighted, is most of our policies usually highlight some path to resolution if problems arise. And I do not see that in this document. So I would be probably prepared to approve it today because it does talk about an annual review process. And perhaps we can have more discussions as a board today or in the future as to whether we would want to add sections like that in the future. Thank you. Director Grieve. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I was actually on uh, the board of UBCM when this was discussed, and um, it went on for quite a while. Arjun Singh was the chair, and if you ever want somebody that's a, a conciliatory, bring people together, seek the middle ground kind of guy, he was it. But at the end of the day, um, it's just, it was decided that uh, these people are duly elected officials. And uh, they may hold opinions that somebody will find offensive. In fact, it's just about impossible today to not offend somebody with just about any opinion. So, you know, there's a fine line between free speech and, 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 uh, and hate speech. Hate speech is criminal and it's defined in, 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 the, in the courts. But... Uh, you know, um, I, I, I agree with the fact that this is a nice to have, but it's totally unenforceable. I think that's, that's recognized. Um, you know, unless you clearly define every single incident that can possibly arise, um, I think, you know, the, the parry and thrust of politics sometimes uh, arouses uh, high, high, high emotion and people say things. Now, I agree. You know, it's inappropriate to say, well, Director Arbor is stupid, but it's totally uh, understandable to say, I think Director Arbor's opinion is stupid, or Director Arbor's position on this issue is stupid. <laughs> so there's a, you know, I think we can, we can probably wiggle waggle around this a little bit, and, but you know, when it comes right down to it, it's just, it's up to our own moral character to police ourselves on this. Because, because there's really no, nothing set in stone. And it's not, I totally agree that disrespect from staff is totally unsupportable. But, you know, the, the, there may be an odd time when somebody will say something that they may have to take back. Maybe they'll take it back in private and, and phone Daniel at home and say, Daniel, I'm really sorry I said that. I didn't mean you were stupid. I meant you had stupid ideas, okay? So, you know, it's, it's, it's all well and fine and it makes us feel good, but you know, when it comes right down to the crux of the matter, there is such a thing as free speech. We're elected officials, we're here to speak our mind, we're here to represent our, our, our constituents, and sometimes it can get a little inflamed. But, you know, um, 
maybe we should have a, a corresponding form to call the hurt feelings report we can all make out when we have hurt feelings. Thank you. Director Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And um, I don't want to pick on Director Arbor. I think he's uh, he's got great ideas as well as ideas I don't agree with. But um, I, I think I'll refrain from using yeah base base terms. But um, I'm, I think this uh, board of uh, code of conduct is extremely worthwhile. I really appreciate seeing it come up on this agenda, and I might suggest that it comes up on um, the inaugural agenda of every uh, after every election cycle. I think that would be really worthwhile just to remind the incoming directors of uh, what's expected. So thanks very much and um, yeah, happily support it. Director Arbor. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I would just like to highlight that um, I, I won't accept the fact that as politicians, we, we do not. So I, I will use the example of the Parliament of Canada where there are parliamentary rules that uh, if members are not in, uh, in, in good standing in the House of Commons, there is a procedure. I will give you an example that the chair could issue a warning. And if the warning was not heeded, the member could be removed for the day. That is a very common occurrence in the House of Commons. I, I can see situations where those tools, I do not see it with this board again, but I can see how, for me, I question why have the policy if we are not intent on having processes so that the policy is actually sees the light of day and, and, and is actually a, a real document rather than something that probably people will just read once at the start of their cycle and then never think about it again. Thank you. Thank you, Director Amir. Thank you, and uh, thanks to Director Arbor for pointing that um, the the process out. That uh, and I agree that um, we might want to ask staff to investigate um, a protocol that um, if if the code of conduct is breached, how what do we do? Um, I think we only need to look to the regional direct direction or the regional regional district to the south of us to see how things can sometimes go sideways at a regional district and. Um, not to say that anyone on this board would would behave in that matter, but as Director Arbor mentioned, this is for you know a, a worst case scenario. So I would like to see some guidelines, uh, be they guidelines or you know uh, you know uh, repercussions, but something from staff to show you know what options this board might have, whether it be a chair. Um, you know, is pulling that director aside or, or what, what can happen. So I, I would support that. My question to staff would be, do you, would you prefer that in a motion or is that direction that you can work with? Um, if you would like us to undertake more research or come back to you with options, uh, a motion to refer. And we're still currently on receipt. Director Hillian. Oh, sorry, Director Moore. Oh, great. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it was a little while back. Probably people remember I sent out an email because I, I disagree with um, Director Grieve that um, that some sometimes, you know, opinions get inflammatory and and that we shouldn't, you know, that we should just think about hurt feelings because um, we can have really strong discussions and be really in, in disagreement, which we have been in this board is obviously quite respectful um, in general, I think, to each other. But there have been times where there have been comments made that um, there's been labels on people and there have been questioning of integrity and, integ and questioning of intention. And, you know, when I went on to um, the code of conduct um, and quoted it in that email, those were some of the things that I was um, wanting to um, kind of illuminate. And I see it as a preventative um, measure so that we all are kind of checking ourselves. And in fact, after I read that code of conduct, I put a lens on myself in terms of how I was speaking and making sure that if I was pointing it out, um, that I was, you know, looking at, at my own role in that. So I think that it is important to have um, something like Director Arbor has, has brought up in terms of not a heavy handed consequence, unless of course it, 
you know, it warrants it. But um, I think even the, um, the chair sending out the, the email, just reminding us or, or when we have had some heated meetings, um, I think that's all important because I think we are responsible for our words and, um, and uh, this doesn't mean that we can't disagree or we can't get into a heated conversation. It's when it crosses the line into questioning integrity or um, labeling people. And this is a public forum. And um, I know I certainly don't want um, to be labeled in that way. Um, and you know, have that kind of conduct in in public or or in camera for that matter. So, I think this is important, and um, and uh, that that we should have a little bit more. Um, I think um, consequence is a strong word, but process in terms of of what happens when when the line gets crossed, and it can start with just a conversation. Um, and obviously, if you feel comfortable with another director to have that one-to-one, -one, then that's great. But people don't always feel comfortable to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. And I appreciate all the perspectives that are being uh, shared um, and find myself uh, agreeing with uh, a number of Councillor Moran's comments. I think, though, that uh, one of the options that uh, there might be for dealing with this is uh, rather than uh, simply reading it or giving it to people uh, at the start of a term, um, attaching um, a little bit of content to that in the form of a, uh, of a short workshop, perhaps as part of the board orientation on uh, how, um, how to deal with uh, perceptions of uh, breaches of a code of conduct. Um, in my view, it, it, uh, the board has uh, the opportunity to bring forward resolutions that uh, either attempt to solicit apologies or perhaps to censure comments that have been made. I think also there's the option of the chair's role in uh, um, stepping in to, uh, uh, to perhaps temper uh, comments that are seen as, um, as out of line. Um, so I think those are available within uh, rules of procedure. But um, I think that it's more likely that uh, those types of things can be used effectively if there's been some orientation uh, among the board members as to how that works. And I'll just give one example. Um, I'm a volunteer at the Community Justice Centre, and one of the uh, things that uh, as a facilitator uh, we remind people of when we start a session is that um, built into the process is the ability to caucus. And uh, that's free to either the respondent, uh, either of the, uh, the, the parties that are there. And uh, we always emphasize that it's because it's part of the procedure available as a tool, that if somebody asks to do that, to, to break from the meeting and caucus, um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's okay. Um, so it, it, this is just an example of a, of a process that uh, is built into the, the way that particular system works. And um, I don't know that, that we need this written into our, our code, but if there's, uh, um, if the, the chair and the board have tools at their disposal um, that they're aware of as part of their rules of procedure um, or just part of their way of operating, and that's spoken about and understood at the start of a term, then it's, um, it's there for everybody to request uh, to be utilized should the need arise. Thanks. Good points, thank you. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for everyone for your candor. This is obviously not the easiest thing to talk about. And I find myself um, agreeing with, uh, with Director Hillian, some sort of workshop to begin uh, each term would be an excellent idea. And some sort of, uh, and with Director Vermeer, some sort of uh, formalized set of consequences graduated going from, as Dr. Morton said, maybe just a conversation to possibly a motion of censure. And uh, just to bring everyone into it, uh, the Director Arbor pointed out that, that the other deliberative bodies, including the House of Commons, which is, you know, the um, par Parliament's the mother of all of all sort of legislatures, has, has had this for, you know, hundreds of years and survived quite well. Um, the, 
I think this rises above the level of, of, of hurt feelings and uh, there's clearly a, a point at which when you stop talking about the ideas and start attacking the people who are, who are speaking, that, uh, that the high spirits of, of politics have gone too far. And like any other place where people come to work, to be listened to, to be respected, uh, um, we are not immune from uh, the need to treat each other with that kind, that kind of courtesy. And I'd like to think that we are, you know, uh, strong enough and big enough people that even in a spirit of discussion, we're able to understand where those reasonable limits lie and uh, respect those around the table. So I think this is useful. I think it would be stronger if we uh, perhaps had some kind of workshop to launch, launch it and uh, some uh, level of, uh, you know, graduated enforcement to wrap it up, but that's for, for further down the, in the discussion. Thanks. Okay. Um, we are on receipt. So is there anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation, but if the board, um, as um, suggested by staff, would like to uh, refer to look at some options for uh, further procedural measures, we can do that. If not, um, we can move the recommendation as, oh, Director Frisch, go ahead. No, I was just going to move the recommendation subject to approval by the uh, Strathcona Comox, uh, Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board. Okay, yeah, and the recommendation is um, that the board approve the code of conduct as presented at Appendix A and um, and is subject to um, approval by the Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board. Thanks. Would we not also need to include the hospital board as we all serve on that board as well as the waste management board, or is that not, not necessary? Um, the uh, hospital board is a separate and distinct board unto itself, whereas the uh, Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board is an extension of this board, so they are, they are subject to these policies. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I'm just wondering if staff uh, um, from any of the discussion felt that there was uh, um, material to move forward with or if a subsequent motion uh, in that regard would still be useful. I think thanks for the conversation. And I think that, um, you know, certainly we can, we can put together some sort of a graduated process or recourse or some language that could speak to some of the comments made here. Uh, and then that would just be more tools in the director's toolbox, if you will, for, uh, for conduct. So um, taking some good notes. And if, if there was a referral, we can certainly put that together. Um, it's up to the board, I think, of, of how you want to proceed. Uh, that said, it is up for an annual review and, and certainly that can be revisited in the future as well. That's what staff was just confirming. Um, okay, thank you. Director Hamir. I was wondering if the mover would, wouldn't mind a friendly amendment to add the phrase and refer staff to um, investigate um, guidelines of enforcement or something to that language. Sure. Um, yeah, he has accepted the amendment. Is, is there any further discussion? So we have it um, that we approve the Appendix A uh, subject to CSWM and refer it to staff for uh, further consideration of procedural matters and enforcement. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. We're on to item nine. Thank you. It's the COVID-19 response and renewal supplemental information. Thank you very much, Chair and Director. So I'll just uh, provide a brief introduction to this report and then answer any of your questions. This uh, board of directors made significant progress and decisions with respect to its response to COVID-19. Today, tonight, earlier on, you celebrated many of those actions that you took in terms of your support for the community services and in turn their support within the community. One of your uh, actions was for the consideration of a response and renewal framework. And that was to be a review of your 97 services and taking a look at uh, 
what our work plans are at present, whether they're relevant moving forward with respect to COVID and the ability of our community to respond in their expectations, as well as look for efficiencies in terms of this board responding to its community and its new place post COVID. Um, as you're aware, 10 reports have come forward to the various committees and commissions of this regional board. They have presented a number of different ideas in terms of how we may move forward. A summary of, of some of those recommendations is in Appendix A of this report. That uh, appendix will be fine-tuned. As this is not the end of the process, you will be moving forward and considering this further in your strategic planning session in mid-September. Also, you wrote to a number of your partners, one being the Solid Waste Management Board and the Regional Hospital District, to have them also consider the matter. The uh, Solid Waste Management Board is considering a report at its next meeting with respect to uh, COVID response and renewal, and you will have their considerations given or provided or presented to you at your strategic planning session. The Regional Hospital Board has not met to consider that uh, letter as of yet, but your chair did meet with the uh, vice chair and chair of that board and it will be considered at their next meeting. This report just wanted to identify eight items or eight considerations that have either been mentioned only in passing in the previous reports or have come to our attention as really relevant to your response and renewal. So this report identifies eight items for supplemental information for your consideration. It's not taking any action or asking for any action on your behalf tonight, but just to bring these matters forward as they may be part of your rethink Comox Valley, your thoughtful consideration of your services. I'll just highlight them. One is resilient emergency programs. Through COVID-19, we operated an emergency operations center as a regional service. An after action report has been presented or prepared, I should say, it will be presented to you in the next couple of weeks. It takes the input from you, the other leaders within the Valley, as well as those that participated in the Emergency Operations Centre, and is going to make some meaningful recommendations for how an Emergency Operations Centre can be more expansive and provide for more community consideration or participation, how there can be uh, better improvements to the networking that is done with political leadership within the Valley, and how real tangible um, improvements to our emergency operations can be implemented as a result of our learnings through this experience. Another thing is Comox Valley collaboration. The idea here is how we work with our staff, municipal staff at the three municipalities in the regional district, finding not only efficiencies in the way that we communicate projects and plans, but how we can move forward for better communications. Also with the potential of broadening that to our stakeholders, be it the Comox First Nations and other community stakeholders. Next is financial stability and sustainable service delivery. The idea here is to advance our financial planning procedures in a way that uh, better informs you and the public with respect to our actions and also looks at asset management and how it will be implemented over time. Fourth is strategic internal resourcing. The concept here is that we are more responsive to you, the board, with respect to our staffing requirements moving forward. We will develop five-year plans for our staffing needs with solid business cases that will be presented to you through the budget process. It also identifies two vacancies that we currently have that can be melded into one position, resulting in one fewer individuals employed by the regional district, but continue to provide good legislative and communication services. Fifth is your support for the economic development and community recovery. The concept of the task force was brought forward not through the COVID action or renewal, but we want to make sure that the community is well aware of your commitment to economic development and working with your partners, Department of National Defense, Comox First Nations, and the three municipalities. This will be supported by the uh, CBEDS and uh, actions will be coming out of the task force for the consideration of the various players within the Valley. And this is just to say that the regional district is supporting that initiative. Advancing collaborative sewer services are some major decisions that have been made over this recent year that see the sewage commission responding to the interest of the electoral area in terms of odor control in, in adjacent to the sewage treatment plant. And it is also looking at the expansion of services to provide services to the south of the Royston Union Bay areas and working with Comox First Nations. This is an unprecedented decision that certainly is a renewal and a different way of doing business. Seventh is supporting community groups and outreach. Um, 
the uh, uh, various reports have come forward, both to the Committee of the Whole and the Electoral Area Directors with respect to the grant program, making sure it's transparent and available. You can see the results of grant programs and your reaction to COVID here. It's just a more responsive program that will be implemented over time. And finally, resilient and adaptable recreation services. Unfortunately, we won't be reporting this out to the Sports Commission until their next meeting, but we wanted to bring to your attention how our recreation services has responded. We're providing to you the schedule of services to be provided through the Sports Centre, where the uh, pool will be opened up shortly, as well as the rinks are providing services to our citizens. It is important to note that this has been done with a very thoughtful and conservative approach. The approach that we're giving is providing the much needed access to our services that our community is asking for through the various surveys that our recreational staff have done. And it is also providing a level service at stage two. As you know, the province is at stage three. This provides resilience in terms of the service that we're providing in the event that there is backward steps that we have to take. We can still, we feel, be able to provide the programs that we're providing in a safe and accessible means. Those are the eight specific actions, as well as transit. Sorry, there's one more, nine. We acknowledge that this regional board is considering various different options and wants more information with respect to the options of transit and where the transit system is moving. We're proposing that during your strategic planning session, we'll have a session with respect to transit and try and flush out your interests. We'll also take a look at some of the challenges with respect to transit, adjusting to the Fifth Street Bridge repair that's proposed for next year and try, trying to provide a way or means for people to commute within our community during that disruption. So the strategic planning session that you will hold is set for September 17th and 18th. Uh, we're getting ready for that. These will be some of the topics and we'll take a look at those finalized reports coming forward. If you have any questions with respect to this, I'm uh, open as well as the other members of our uh, uh, executive management team if you have anything specific to any of our services. Are there any questions, Dr. Hamir? I just wanted to say kudos to staff for all of the work. This is a, it's summarized very succinctly here, but I know just how many hours of work um, went into each of these, uh, looking at each of these services um, so in depth and uh, reassessing. Um, I also just want to say I, I, um, I really like the, the fact that we're sort of going into a level two on our rec services, despite the fact that the province is at level three, looking at um, the numbers on Vancouver Island and, and sort of an upward trend right now in COVID numbers, I think this is a really um, a conservative but really well um, considered option. Um, I know the province has said that there are no, not going to be any back steps, that they don't want to go backwards, but um, I think the community um, may disagree. So having us at a more conservative um, access to services is, is really, um, I think, well thought out. So thank you. Yeah, this review is really important for us as directors um, to give us the information that we need of uh, the impacts of COVID and, and what things are going to um, look like for us uh, moving forward. So. Uh, I think it's, you know, extremely important that we have all this information uh, before us to help in our decision making process. I do have a question about um, the appendix and uh, just an, as an example, some of the short term renewal actions. Um, there's very specific items in here. Um, including uh, us finding um, close to $30,000 in savings. Uh, from our uh, Comox Valley Emergency Program uh, by postponing, suspending, and uh, canceling some minor uh, capital projects. Um, I, I know that was something that the board expressed some concern about. Um, are, are we going to be going through these items um, in the appendix one by one at our strategic planning, or is this something um, that um, each individual department, uh, department is going to be making a decision on? Um, certainly, we heard you with respect to emergency services. And I would like to, to clarify that um, much of the savings is just really a result of those things that have been deferred as a result of COVID with respect to that. Much of the programming and such will continue with respect to that. What we will do with these specific actions is really make them succinct 
and short and sweet for you. At, and so hopefully it won't take a lot of time, but if there are individual actions that here that you as a board want to reflect on or maybe adjust or, or ask us to look on, you'll be able to give that direction in the strategic planning process. Great, thank you very much. Any further comments or questions? And we're still on receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? That's carried, so there's a recommendation. And that's that the COVID-19 response renewal initiative as included with the staff report of August 20th be approved for further consideration through the 2020 strategic planning and subsequent implementation. And that's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's unanimous, thank you. And we're on to bylaws and resolutions. For third reading, there's bylaw number 619 Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, and it's a vote of the areas. Director Hamir? In favor. Director Arbor? In favor. Director Grieve? In favor. In favor. That's unanimous. Thank you. And we're on to first, second, and third readings for bylaw 614, Greater Merville. Thank you. Greater Merville Fire Protection Service loan authorization. And we have first and second reading first. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Okay, for third reading, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. unanimously. And we're on to adoption of bylaw number 620. Thank you. That's the CVRD property tax exemption by law. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we're on to bylaw number 621. Oh, did we do that twice? No, six, right, okay, thank you. And then again, it's the vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And that brings us to new business. Thank you. Item one is the public hearing for bylaw number 604. And this is a vote of the areas. And it's just a vote on receipt. So Dr. Gree. Director Arbor, Director Hamir, that's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Thank you. And you can see the recommendation on your screen. It's a very long recommendation. <laughs> and it's again a vote of the areas. Yes, thank you. So at the end of this recommendation, there is an appointment of directors for chair and vice chair from the area, from the areas. Uh, Director Grieve, oh, no, Director Arbor. I'm Sorry, it's Director Arbor. <laughs> yeah. So you know he's got, he wasn't quick <laughs> enough. I would like to, uh, <laughs> I would, well, just just because Dr. Grant said that, I would like to appoint uh, Dr. Hamir as chair and, and Dr. Uh, Grieve as vice chair. Exactly. <laughs> okay, Director Grieve, do you still wish to speak? Okay. <laughs> so that's for Dr. Hamir as chair and Dr. Grieve as vice chair. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we are on to item two, which is, uh, thank you, the UBCM director at large. And I might just pass it over to Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you all for entertaining this motion. Um, uh, I put my name forward as for UBCM director at large. Um, 
there are many obviously important issues that are going to be addressed over the course of a year at DBCM. One of the things that drove me to particularly um, put my name forward is over the course of this year, I've been working uh, with a group called PACE BC on the steering committee. And PACE is a, um, it's a mechanism for borrowing against the value of, of a building uh, in order to finance retrofits, um, uh, alternative heating, for example, heat pumps, so the installation of solar energy, um, electric vehicle chargers, uh, things of that nature. And we've been fortunate to have the support of uh, Don Lidstone, who's actually drafted the enabling legislation required and had some very positive uh, discussions with the provincial government, with ministers. And a resolution to that effect uh, was passed at UBCM last year. And the status of it, according to the UBCM kind of uh, website, is that uh, they are in continuing discussions with the uh, provincial government. And I would uh, I'd really welcome the opportunity to be part of those discussions. I think this could be, PACE offers the opportunity to be a substantial part of greenhouse gas reduction, as well as a, an enormous uh, jobs generator in the US. It's produced to almost a quarter of a million retrofits and at least 60,000 jobs. And in the year of COVID recovery, having good, well-paid local jobs that can't be shipped offshore, that, uh, the, that uh, produce a net benefit in terms of lowering our greenhouse gases and cleaner air uh, seems worthwhile. So a short plug for PACE, but it's something which I would like to take the opportunity to try and move forward, uh, if at all possible, uh, through a position on the uh, UBCM Board of Directors. So thank you for taking the time to consider this. Thanks very much for putting your name forward. And Director Arbor. Was it moved? Sorry. Uh, no, we're on receipt. On receipt. Okay, sorry, had that a bit, but all the same, I'll make my intervention before. And, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for putting your name forward. It's really heartening to see that we have representative of this board at uh, you know stepping up for positions at all levels with EVICC, with uh, Director Frisch, now with you at UBCM and um, Director Grieve at FCM. And uh, I'm really thrilled to hear about these. And uh, as you were talking, I was just thinking about, um, I think you'll be a great candidate as, as in your own words to, uh, to look at single solution for multiple problems is I think what you were talking about. And this one seems to fit in that category. So thanks for, uh, for nomination. And, and uh, I know it's a competitive race. So I think to all the fellow directors here, I think we'll have to remember to vote and uh, I remember the noise we made for Director Grieve at FCM in, in Quebec City, and and uh, Bob Wells was part of it, and we're pretty annoyed. No, so we won't have that opportunity because it won't be in person, but we'll be there for to support you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll move uh, the recommendation. Um, how about we just uh, move receipt first? Any anyone opposed to receipt? Um, go ahead, Director Marin. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to obviously throw my support behind Director Cole Hamilton and, um, you know, you're mentioning one aspect of something that you want to advocate for, but we know that there's tons and tons of contributions that you'll make um, if and when you're elected. And um, I don't know if Director Arbor knows I have a community theatre background, but I have fairly good projections, so I think I'm probably up to the task of uh, of uh, emulating um, Bob Wells um, for uh, cheering for, in fact, my son didn't like me at his lacrosse games because um, the sports centre would shake when I was there. So I'll do my very best to uh, be loud on your behalf. Thanks. So we have moved receipts. So um, there is a motion, a recommendation. Okay, and that's that the board provide a letter of support to Director Will Cole Hamilton to be considered as a candidate for director at large at UBCM for 2020. Any further comment? And that's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Now we do have one late item, and that is the amendment to function 451. Thank you. Uh, do staff want to speak to this? Um, um, I, I can speak briefly to the report if, if you agree to consider it. 
Okay. Um, is there anyone opposed to receipt? Rece okay. Um, all in favor of consideration? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, just um, it, brought, it was brought to our attention that uh, Don to Don are proposing a one bedroom as opposed to a three bedroom apartment and the previous resolution or support from the board was on the basis of three. So this is just to qual qualify or clarify that. And we reached out to the coalition and they support this initiative. So it's just coming forward so that we may uh, wrap this matter up and, and provide the funding as requested. Any further comments, questions? Okay, there is a recommendation. And as the Oh, yes, we do need receipt. Thank you, Director Hillian. <laughs> Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And as the CAO said, it's just an amendment. Um, the the three once was a three bedroom condo that was going to be purchased and now it's a one bedroom condo um, being purchased by Don to Don. So all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's unanimous, thank you. And we'll go to in camera. Thanks everyone. <laughs> 